Hello, thank you for choosing this lecture on is there a role for hypnotherapy in treating insomnia? My name is Sherry Causable. I am a registered respiratory therapist, a registered polysomnography technologist. I have a certification in clinical sleep health and I am a certified clinical hypnotherapist. So the objectives, the objectives of this lecture are one, to list the risk factors for insomnia in the general population. Two, define hypnotherapy and its relevancy to the insomniac. Three, describing the role of hypnotherapy in mindfulness training. And finally, four, describing how hypnotherapy can treat insomnia and maintain sleep health. So what is hypnosis? Hypnosis as a general definition is a state of con consciousness involving focused attention and reduced peripheral awareness characterized by a capacity for response to suggestion. So if we look at this definition and we think about the average everyday things that we do, when we focus all our intention on one thing, and we notice that the side, everything else around us sort of fades away, and we find that we're really involved in that one thing, that is hypnosis. So to familiarize yourself a little bit with that would be driving, focusing in on a lecture, um, daydreaming, and things like that. So basically, we are in the hypnotic state many times per day, depending on what's going on with our day. So uh, actively hypnotized is a different thing in that someone is actively moving your conscious awareness away from beta down to alpha and into the alpha theta state. So most people can be actively hypnotized. It just really comes down to do they want to be hypnotized? And when we look at the brain wave activity that's happening in the hypnotic state, we have anywhere from alpha, theta, delta, and gamma brain activity that are present, depending on the depth of hypnosis. So brain activity and states of consciousness. So there's several different levels of uh, consciousness and brain activity that are associated with that. The highest one is the beta state. So you can see there's quite a wide range, anywhere between 40 and 14 hertz. In the higher range of beta, this is where you're probably going to be in a fight flight state. You're in, um, maybe if you're a healthcare worker, you're working actively in the uh, ER, or if you're a uh, first responder, then you're working on a, a call. In the low beta state, you're going to be um, taking part in some, you know, passive activity where you're um, listening to someone else in conversation, you're waiting quietly for something, and um, you're in that nice sort of calm, but uh, somewhat focused state. Alpha state is anywhere between seven and a half to 14 hertz. And this is the gateway to your subconscious mind and intuition. It is deep physical mental relaxation. You have all of your awareness in the state. Um, people who are very practiced at it can achieve it with their eyes open. Although most of us will require to have our eyes closed for this. Uh, we see this uh, again with daydreaming and light meditation. It is also um, that gateway to um, sleep as well. Alpha theta border is seven to eight hertz. So it's this optimal range for visualization. Again, you're, you're quite conscious um, and aware of your surroundings, um, but your body is quite relaxed and you just really don't care about other things that are going on around you and you're more focused on one thing. So this is where we commonly work in hypnosis, although we can work a little bit deeper, which is the theta, and that's between four and seven and a half hertz. And this is deep meditation, light sleep, and REM is where we also see um, the theta brainwave activity. And this is all subconscious. So when we work in the theta, you are still aware of everything. You're still aware of all of your surroundings, but you're dealing specifically with the subconscious mind. So um, it's a very interesting place to be a uh, recall of memories that you didn't realize that you had, uh, like maybe from when you were a child, you can go back to specific days and times and remember uh, what you said, what you did, uh, what you're wearing with your clothes, 
it, it's quite a, a very interesting um, state to be in. And this is the subconscious. Next deeper is uh, Delta. And so this is uh, 0.5 to 4 heart hertz. And it's basically um, a, a very deep uh, dreamless sleep or transcendental meditation. We also use it in hypnosis. It has been used um, in the far past with um, surgeries in other countries uh, back when things like um, uh, medications to um, induce uh, unconsciousness were not available in sorry, different uh, formats. So um, it is basically used for um, detaching completely from conscious awareness. And it is deep conscious, deep subconscious. And this is also where we see um, work that we can do with deep healing. Um, and the Delta wave activity has got a lot to do with that and how it stimulates some, in some way um, the, uh, the release of growth hormone in the body. And growth hormone is responsible for um, regeneration and healing um, in the body itself. The last one is gamma wave. We call it the insight wave. It's, it's relatively new, most recently discovered. It's where people like um, researchers like Dr. Joe Dispenza are working at. It's above 40 hertz. It's quite unique. It's um, like I mentioned here on my slide, it has um, associations of bursts of insight and high level information processing. They also talk about um, healing uh, abilities in the state although it's still very, very new. So the progression of consciousness, so hypnosis or meditation. So in, um, in med hypnosis or meditation, it, it is, they are actually just shifts of consciousness. They're the same thing. It's just about the depth and about whether there is a, um, a point of focus. So meditation is all about, um, you know, clearing the mind, but it's not about not having thoughts. It's just about detaching from what you would call the ego and um, moving in towards inner self. Hypnosis is more for um, focusing on specific one thing. So you come into a hypnosis session, you're wanting to work on quitting smoking. So you have the intent on being a non-smoker. So when we go into the hypnosis session, um, the focus is all on that and it's all in concepts based around that. So everything else strips away who you are, what you've done in the past. And it's more so on um, the exact thing that we're focusing on within that state of hypnosis. So uh, beta wave activity, when you look at different types of um, uh, brainwave activity that we're going into with these two um, types of um, of consciousness, the beta wave activity, this is where we're awake and we're, we're doing things like um, somatic exercises or in low beta, we're doing problem solving and reasoning. So um, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine uses a, um, a format with their CBTI, they use somatic exercises to help people move from a high beta wave activity to low beta wave activity. And they'll use these exercises, um, they'll recommend these exercises such as the progressive muscle relaxation and breathing exercises such as diaphragmatic breathing. Um, and then uh, the alpha wave activity, this is our gateway to the subconscious mind. This is the, the key um, state of consciousness to be aware of for achieving things like sleep and moving into the subconscious realm. So it's, it's really the gateway to subconscious mind. We work a lot with it with neuro-linguistic programming. Um, and then of course, learning concentration. So if you're studying, you're um, taking an exam or, or um, listening to a lecture, you'll wanna be in this alpha wave activity because it will help you retain um, and learn at a much faster and, um, easier, like uh, reten retentive sort of way, because it's all going to the subconscious mind where everything is stored. Alpha theta border is a state of conscious creation. So this is, like I said, again, where we work a lot with hypnosis. We also use other techniques uh, such as imprinting and timeline therapy. So we can um, help people basically ride the timeline of their lives 
um, and they can take various sort of resources and, and, and uh, put them into place into uh, times in the past where they felt that um, things that they're stuck perhaps, and then they can change how they feel in general about um, their life in the um, current state. It's quite an interesting sort of work that we do with that one. The other one is uh, theta wave activity, complete subconscious. So we're just going a little bit deeper into uh, uh, hypnosis in this one. It's the highest suggestibility state because we're just a little further into that subconscious mind. We can still do some work from the conscious level here. Um, we're not using the conscious mind, but we uh, the conscious mind is aware of what's going on in the subconscious. So we we do we can talk to people in this state. Um, they can work through things. They can also do stuff with um, the timeline therapy and the imprinting as well. I actually find that they'll go in and out of the alpha theta um, and into just straight theta in this sort of format, depending on what sort of work is needing to be done. And they'll just uh, naturally do this. It's, it's quite an interesting thing to see. Uh, you'll see it with deep meditation and prayer. And it's, it's quite a strong internal focus. It's very, very interesting work that can be done here when you can help somebody um, go in there and restructure or um, reframe some limiting beliefs that they have in there. Delta wave activity, it's a somnambulism um, for healing regeneration. This is complete subconscious, complete unconscious sort of work. We don't um, have any sort of memory of what's happening when someone's in this state. And then again, uh, this at gamma wave activity, this is our, um, our insight wave. And then to, to go um, back again up into uh, consciousness where going up from gamma to delta to theta to alpha theta alpha and then back to beta so progressively down from beta all the way from alpha alpha theta theta delta gamma and then back up again so this is the the format that we follow when we're shifting our consciousness so falling asleep when you look at falling asleep we're doing this very similarly except we have a different intent going into it so when you are getting ready for bed, you have this thought that, yeah, I'm tired, my body needs rest, I'm going to be going to bed soon, you're going to be doing some typical activities that are um, your usual sort of preparation time so that your body has all these cues that it's going to go to sleep. And that also helps with the hormones, which also helps with um, the thoughts that you have uh, during the, you know, the evening as well, that's going to prep you for um, going lower into those different states of consciousness. So if we look at um, falling asleep, we have this beta wave activity. Uh, this is where people stay in, uh, in insomnia. So they just can't um, gear down. They uh, are either ruminating or they're staying in quiet conversation to either avoid the alpha or alpha theta border or they're doing it because they are so practiced at staying in beta that they just can't get out of it. And um, this is where we find people with insomnia are stuck. Alpha wave activity, uh, it induces calm for anxiety. So um, when people kind of shift down into alpha, we find that they're, they go into the super body calmness. You'll um, be familiar with it um, with um, people that close their eyes when they first get into bed and then they have that big deep breath in and out, they're going into alpha as they're doing that. It's basically their body tuning into what's happening in the brain. The other way we see this too is um, when people are in flow state. So if you, people are writing a book, they're um, uh, painting a picture, they're drawing, they're speaking, and they lose track of time. This is what we call flow state, and it's also alpha wave activity. It's extremely creative. And this is a part of why we use it with NLP as well. Um, and it also is our bridge into sleep because it is that gateway to the subconscious mind. Alpha theta border is our stage one sleep. So this is where we're kind of messing around with the idea back and forth of uh, being in the state of calm consciousness and into subconsciousness. So this is the theta. And um, it's so brief that we're in this state. It's a uh, maximum of 20 minutes that you'll see somebody in the alpha theta border. 
Uh, theta wave activity uh, stage uh, two sleep is where we see most of our theta wave activity with sleep. So, and we'll also see some in REM. And then as you go deeper into stage three sleep, you've got some delta wave activity. And then of course that growth hormone for body repair and regeneration. So it's just this general sort of gearing down from, again, from beta, alpha, alpha, beta, beta, and delta. And of course, these aren't exactly the same as shifts in consciousness for meditation or hypnosis, but they are um, the predominance of these um, brainwave activities that we see between the two. So what's the subjective experience? How are you feeling when you're in each one of these ones? I've touched on this a little bit, but just basically, we're going from that fight flight and the high beta, integrative focus and relaxed. Um, so basically, you're you're studying quite actively, you're um, in conversation, maybe you're listening to a lecture and you're actively learning in low beta. Alpha, you're, you're more in this calm state of peace, like this woman here who is enjoying the sun on her face. And um, it puts you in that state of creativity and mental resourcefulness. It really is a great place to be for problem solving. And the interesting part about alpha is there is no active trying here. This is just a state of being. It's a pure state of uh, relax and calm. Alpha theta border, um, this is where you know, we have that stage one sleep or working um, with uh, hypnosis. And it's abstract thinking. Uh, we've got um, dealing with sensations such as you know, working with um, neuro-linguistic programming and of course, self-control. So we like to work in these sort of situations with things like um, addictions um, counseling or addictions um, work with hypnosis. Theta is where it's, of course, the subconscious. Now, subconscious, a lot of people will say it's my intuition or it's that feeling of oneness and it's all the same thing. Depending on your background and your understanding and what resonates with you, you'll call it one thing or another, but it is all the same thing. Um, recall is amazing in this state. Like I said, people remember all these memories that they didn't uh, think they still had. Uh, imagery, people that can come up with visualizations. It's just incredible, actually. And uh, daydreaming, that's another um, thing where people will can go into to theta as well. So this is that hypnosis that driving while you're not really moving your eyes and trying to stay awake you're focused on that road and before you know it you can slip into theta with your eyes open delta is that deep body relaxation zero conscious awareness there is no feelings here <laughs> you're just you're out the lights were on and now they're off think of um anesthesia uh, gamma is calm intense focus and even though it is considered deeper than delta it is actually quite different because it is above 40 hertz. Um, and it because of that is uh, what people will call a spiritual awakening. People also get that when they're moved to tears and um, states of bliss with listening to music um, that, that so, uh, quote unquote, touch them. So training the brain. So what happens if you train your brain too much in one of these states? So in high beta, this is our fight flight. This is where we see uh, paramedics, um, first responders, people working like this. And what they have is a constant state of alertness or agitation. They're triggered very easily by certain things in their environment, but also see it a lot in attention deficit disorder. People that spend too much time in low beta actually have relaxed focus and intention. It's actually um, what we get when you work on what we call study skills. So intense focus where you're um, actively learning, but you're, you're not hyper-focused. You're not uh, to the exclusion of all else like you are in alpha theta. Uh, alpha is when you're in the, the high alpha and you're practiced in the high alpha state, you're really good at centering back into your body, um, getting back into touch with what your body is capable of in terms of healing, what it needs. Am I hungry or am I just thirsty? What is that, um, that craving really about? It's that mind-body connection. That's what we get really good at when we practice high alpha. We also see that a little bit in the low alpha, but we get actually more deeper in that we actually do a mind-body integration with low alpha. 
and just this beautiful inner awareness of of who you are deep down it's it's quite a beautiful thing so this is uh that that mindfulness as meditation sort of state that people are always um searching for and when people say they, they've got to meditate or they're they're working on meditating that they're doing is training their brain to be in this state the alpha state Alpha theta border. Uh, so this is the hypnosis state we work in a lot. I often see this with people. They get um, more and more when they come for each session. They get really good at visualizing. They get really good at going into it quicker. And their uh, capacity for abstract thinking and trusting their, themselves it just goes through the roof. It's really a beautiful thing. Theta wave activity, when people get good at uh, training in this, um, they can really drift. They can um, really go um, basically into um, letting go of all uh, preconceived stories about, you know, predicting the future and um, that that whole high beta feel of trying to predict, trying to prepare. They're just uh, in simple bliss of just being. It's, it's really cool. Uh, suppressed, suppressed theta wave activity when you, you get really good at, at it's shutting that down, basically your subconscious, you're getting improved concentration and attentiveness. So you're actually um, keeping yourself in that low or high beta. And this is where we see people who uh, are practicing the high beta. They also are very good at suppressing their theta wave activity. And unfortunately, theta wave activity is also a component of sleep, a very big component of sleep. So this is part of where we see insomnia issues when people are practiced in the fight flight mode. Delta wave activity, people are good at doing delta wave activity. Oh my goodness, deep, deep relaxation. And we also see really good um, body repair and regeneration happening. You'll see this when people are fighting uh, viruses, the body just automatically is really good at shifting us deep into deep sleep. You'll find people who are sick, they will sleep a lot more so than they thought they were capable of doing. And what their body is doing is shifting them down into that delta wave activity to get that growth, uh, body repair and regeneration going. So how do we shift into these states, making that mental switch? This is very similar to what we see with American Academy of Sleep Medicine when they talk about their cognitive behavioral therapy uh, programs for insomnia. They are, are talking about shifting consciousness um, from a very purposeful place. Soft lighting is one, this is a cue to the body. It's that circadian rhythm um, that shifts that we're talking about. We wanna be um, in line with what our uh, demands of our day is in terms of light exposure. So when your body is supposed to be, when you're supposed to be up and working or you're supposed to be engaged with family or what have you, you're wanting the, the stronger lighting that's going to mimic more of a midday sort of sun. So that's going to tell your body and the internal and intrinsic body clock that it's time to be awake and alert and uh, ready to interact with people. As you're understanding that you need to start to gear down for the night, you're gonna start turning the lighting down softer and softer as if it were um, the sun. So of course, if we could tie our day to the, to the sun, that would be great. But most of the time that doesn't work that way, depending on what parts of the world you live in. Sometimes we get more sun um, than, uh, you know, we require more sleep than what the sun is uh, giving us and, um, and vice versa. So it's just manipulating the light that you have to help uh, your body take the cues that it needs to get the pressures to sleep when it needs to and the pressures to wake when it also needs it. Reading is another way to help get that sort of um, uh, less intense uh, intense um, feel of the high beta. So gearing you down from that high uh, fight flight response into like a soft focus of reading. Taking a bath, it's a somatic cue. So it's soft, it feels warm and inviting and um, it allows the body to, to gear down as well into more of like that alpha state. Meditation or apps on guided meditation. So the, this is again, uh, an, a conscious way of understanding that you're wanting to go from this higher beta level down into this alpha or alpha theta. 
listening to calming music. This is more like thinking of um, using your external environment as a tuning fork in a different way uh, other than light. So just using frequency, our brain works on frequencies. So attuning it to frequencies that are gonna allow you to shift down is um, really, really helpful for a lot of people. You notice um, in some circumstances where you feel like you put on soft music, it makes you wanna feel like you're going to sleep and that's because you're tuning your brain wave activity to the, those lower states of consciousness. Audiobooks are just good for detaching you from uh, your crap from your day, basically. It is um, a way of um, tuning out. So when you do that, it's a little bit easier for you to, um, to stop the hyper-focus on the things that are bothering you. Gentle stretching, again, it's a body cue, allows the body to release that tension and the stress from a physical standpoint. And when you do that, those uh, the hormone release, that serotonin and dopamine that you get from it also um, brings on that alpha pattern. So from wake to sleep, how do we bridge that gap? So hypnosis and mindfulness, they facilitate the ease of the consciousness shift because you are actively engaging in um, shifting that consciousness. You know exactly what you're doing. And when you see that you're doing it, when you're getting those results as you're doing it, it becomes more and more repeatable. And then um, the low beta and the alpha state, because you can achieve them more often and when you want to, um, it becomes a more frequent state of consciousness during the day as well. So you can use those states for problem solving and um, just feeling more calm in, in your day. Uh, whereas before um, you weren't quite aware that that's where you were and that those could be used in, in, in such a way. Um, they also you know, are, are so helpful in widening your perspective. When you think of high beta, High beta, what it does is it, it hyper-focuses you. Fight flight, when you think about it, it focuses you on one thing. And that's, uh, you know, keeping a person alive, keeping yourself alive, running from the bear, whatever. And you have to hyper-focus on that one thing. And if you're trained well enough, you'll understand that the tools that you have to do that effectively, if you're not, or if you're in a high... A high enough state of arousal, you you might even go into that that freeze, uh, the fight or the the flight or or the the freeze piece, and um and in that situation you're not doing anything, and the potential for disaster is is quite high. So when you look at the alpha or beta patterns, it actually calms the mind enough that you can access all the resources for everything that you know about a situation. You actually think about, I often will um, liken this to um, shining a light in a dark room. So if you focus your flashlight on one piece and you can adjust the focus on that flashlight onto one part of the room, in a fight flight situation, you're focusing on that one person that needs help, but that's all you can see in the room in fight flight stage. In the alpha and low beta stage, that, um, a flashlight moves to a much wider focus and it opens up the view to the entire room. And now you can see you have coworkers, you have, um, you know, all these other tools that are available to help you help that person better. So this is why working actually um, in alpha and low beta, even in critical situations, is even more helpful than working in high beta for the most part. Wider perspective um, with this, you know, problem solving, it just gives you all these mental resources that, of course, that's got to lead to increased confidence. And when you have all this confidence, you're going to be resilient. It doesn't matter what happens in the environment. You know what you have and, you know, you have the tools to handle everything. And, uh, of course, this is going to lower your stress levels. So it has this feedback sort of mechanism where we start to lower those stress levels. We allow even more time in that low beta or alpha state. So it feeds on itself in a very good way. So insomnia disorder, what is insomnia disorder? It's defined in the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, Volume 3, as a complaint of trouble initiating or maintaining sleep. And it's associated with the daytime consequences that is not attributable to environmental circumstances, 
such as um, being able to be uh, exposed to the sun at appropriate times or the in inadequate opportunity to sleep. So maybe you stayed up too long watching that movie overnight. It includes both acute and chronic insomnia and chronic is just uh, the fact that it is um, three times a week for greater than three months at a time. And acute of course is uh, it would last for less than three months at a time. Uh, daytime sleepiness is a big um, symptom of insomnia disorder or fatigue, depending on how people are perceiving um, the way their body is feeling. And it also is uh, associated with decreased immune function. Uh, we also see impaired cognitive processes, of course, when the brain um, is not getting the, a number of hours slept because when in insomnia disorder, uh, the big thing that we see is that sleep efficiency is, is quite reduced because people are spending more time um, laying awake in bed than they are sleeping in bed. And they uh, are not being able to go through those sleep cycles like they need so that they can defrag their hard drive, so to speak. Uh, this leads to um, situations such as mood disorders and memory deficits as well. Insomnia prevalence, this is a very tough one. Um, it's estimated to be anywhere between five and 15% among the general population. Among healthcare workers, it's much higher, somewhere around 20 to 33%. But again, we don't know because um, it's not often reported as much as it should. It's not recognized as a problem for the person who's suffering for it. They just assume that this is a function of the job that they're in. Maybe they're a, um, a paramedic or a firefighter and this is expected of this work or um, they don't want to report it because they don't want to be perceived as weak or broken. Um, and you know, we see this among healthcare workers more so than the general population because of uh, the, the unique nature of the healthcare environment. Um, we're dealing with things in the healthcare environment that are life-threatening, um, it's 24 hours, there's a culture associated with it um, that you just need to be on all the time. And the idea of shutting down is, is either not being competent or it's, it's too scary to do because when you finally stop from reacting to, to you know, difficult situations, now the brain is gonna wanna process that. And for some people that can be too scary to do. Um, it's a component insomnia of um, other sleep disorders like shift work disorder, um, or it, it can be um, all, you know, all on its own. Um, it's advanced age uh, is where we see this a lot. Female gender is another one. And we also see uh, both the acute and chronic care models in these populations. We also think um, there's got to be some sort of hormonal or brain structure components that are involved in this as well. We also see it with um, mood disorders, people that have mood disorders, again, chicken or the egg, it's hard to say. So insomnia and healthcare workers. So again, like I, I was mentioning before, fight flight, that emergency response mentality is always on. Uh, the focus is on a patient outcome as opposed to self-care. Uh, you're not thinking of yourself when you're in that fight flight mode, you need to help that person because if you don't do it right, if you're thinking about anything else at that time, then you're probably not going to do your job to the best of your ability. Unfortunately, that has long term consequences on the healthcare worker. Uh, fatigue culture, like I said, is normal and familiar. It doesn't um, mean that it is. It just means that it's prevalent. So um, my job here is to uh, bring a little bit of light to that and hopefully there can be some changes in the future on it. Uh, we also see a daily coping of loss of life, even when you've done your best job with, uh, as a healthcare worker, and sometimes you just, you're not, um, you're not gonna be successful in helping that individual. And we also see that uh, circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorder is prevalent. Uh, it's uh, in the, of the extrinsic variety and basically because of night shifts and um, uh, working in an uh, environment where there's artificial light only. So how do we manage sleep disturbances? So in general, the first thing that we do is look at what people are doing. Um, how are they uh, eating? How are they exercising? 
And what are they doing with their slate? Um, how are they timing it? Um, what's the quality? What's the quantity? We just get a real good idea of what they're doing um, in general, because all of these things can be optimized prior to uh, putting in place some of these therapies. Uh, from the cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia point of view, this is the program that is associated or that is um, uh, recommended as the primary treatment for insomnia by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Um, they talk about education. Uh, if you know what's going on, you know that it is about shifts of consciousness. You know about you know um, different ways to help you shift that consciousness. Um, looking at yourself as a whole, whereas with your diet, your exercise, and the mental health piece of it, um, and that you get access to these psychological and behavioral therapies that you can be taught, and then you can implement on your own going forward as a tool in your toolkit. So um, they suggest you know, so many activities based um, on these principles to alleviate that stress load, and of course, optimize that hormonal pressure to sleep and minimize um, extrinsic stressors and stimuli in the environment. So what do we do for insomnia? So like I was mentioning, it's these psychological and behavioral interventions. These are the primary interventions for all ages, including chronic hypnotic users, which are the people that we typically see when they finally reach out for help. They're usually on some sort of medication. Um, whether it's over the counter or something from a um, family doctor and um, you know when it's first treated as acute insomnia and then uh, at some point is recognized as okay this is a chronic situation and now it's starting to affect things like mood and digestion and and things like that that's when we start to um, see the special specialties and um, implement these uh, cognitive behavioral therapies except first line treatment when CBTI is not either not available, not affordable to the, um, to the patient, then they'll look at doing the, um, the brief behavioral interventions, which is the abbreviated version of CBTI. CBTI is about eight weeks um, and the B BTI is about four weeks. And the behavioral therapy that we're talking, uh, behavioral therapy component that we're talking about with these uh, interventions include things like stimulus control therapy, relaxation therapy, and just education about behaviors that influence sleep. So cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, um, it's cognitive therapy, that stimulus control, the sleep restriction, the sleep hygiene and relaxation. So I love this that they say that it's based on the idea that the way you think and feel about something is um, that can affect what you do. So this is perception. This is perception in uh, its purest sense. And this is what we deal with with hypnosis as well. We also understand that stress leads to, you know, poor uncharacter uncharacteristic decisions and calm leads to characteristic balance decisions. So basically um, we wanna change the way you think and feel so that you can see that change what happens in your world. So how that ends up manifesting. The key concept of cognitive behavioral therapy is that these thought and behavior patterns can be changed. And again, same thing with hypnosis. If we started them, we can change them. Uh, availability and cost, of course, is can be an issue because um, only certain um, uh, people can uh, dispense this sort of uh, therapies. Pharmacotherapy, so this is um, something that people will, um, the physician who is doing the CBTI or the BTI will use because CBTI can um, take a, a quite a while to um, notice uh, improvements. And what the pharmacotherapy does is it gives you some immediate improvement, gets you off of that chronic hypnotics that weren't working that the patient came in with and put them on something that's a little bit more effective and keep the patient um, feeling a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more um, uh, rested while they are learning the long-term tools, the cognitive behavioral tools to um, be successful without the, the, the pharmacology. Uh, it's, of course, you know, depending on what you pick, um, it's going to be depending on um, comorbidities of the, the patient. So uh, we don't want any contraindications there availability of depending on what part of the world you live in, of course, cost, 
and patient preference. Some people um, have an issue with, you know, being knocked out. Some people, that's all they want. And the treatment goal. So what are you looking to get from this medication? Do you want to um, decrease your stress and anxiety so that you can get to sleep? Or do you want something that's going to be more of a sedative type effect so that um, you, while you're working on shifting your states of consciousness, that you won't have any middle insomnia? Sleep, sleep restriction therapy. So this goes back to that, um, that in middle insomnia piece. So basically a lot of people will come in saying, well, I can get to sleep because I'm so tired, but then I wake up during the night and I can't get back to sleep. This is what we call middle insomnia. It's um, a popular method that we use with this is uh, to sleep restriction. So we'll give a diary to the patient, ask them to keep uh, a log on when they went to bed, when they got up, and the estimated hours that they spent in bed. And what we'll do is we'll start with that estimation of how long they think they slept, and we'll ask them to decrease their time in bed to that time only. So let's say, for example, previously they were spending 10, 11 hours in bed, and they said, I only slept half of that, maybe six hours. And so we would ask them, okay, we want you to spend six hours in bed, and then you would increase the time according to how that person is, is um, starting to feel. So once they feel like they've had enough rest, they wake up feeling uh, restored and rested, um, that's, that would be the final time in bed that they would, um, they would stay with. The, it's, it's unpopular with patients because as you can imagine, um, cutting the sleep time in bed um, is going to decrease um, the actual time that they had before because a lot of people um, really don't have a good idea of, of the time that they think they actually slept. And on top of that, when you're laying in bed and you're just kind of laying there in a relaxed sort of state, you are being calm, you are actually helping uh, your stress levels and your body by being in that relaxed state. So when we restrict you, we keep you out of bed and um, until you're, you're super tired and um, you, then you get this small amount of time, you're going to be hypersomnolent um, even more so to start. So we can't really do this for um, uh, mood disorders and seizures because they'll exacerbate those sort of conditions. And we also can't do that for safety critical occupations because we can't make them even more tired than they were. So it does have a lot of limitations for certain groups of the population. Stimulus control, this is a big one in um, hypnosis. So when we um, look at associations that people have, so uh, phobias, um, uh, just limiting beliefs in general about the world, it's rarely that the person has an issue with the actual object. It's the thought or the idea that they've attached to the object. So this goes back to our predictive human nature and negative experience giving us insomnia. So as human beings, we'll have an experience with something. Let's say you go to get onto a plane. You're not feeling particularly well that day from, I don't know, maybe a bad sandwich or you weren't sleeping enough before that time. You get on the plane and it's a rather rougher ride. You get off the plane and go, oh, that wasn't great. No big deal. You put it out of your mind. The next time you go get on a plane, your body goes, oh, remember that time and then you and then the body seems to think okay this is going to be rough again and then what people will notice is they'll get that pit in their stomach and they don't know why and they they don't seem to understand like there's this sort of disconnect between okay I shouldn't be feeling this way but my body's telling me so I got this gut sort of reaction and that gut that instinct is the subconscious that said hey remember that time when it doesn't mean that they're in danger. It just means that they had a prior experience and now it's predicting that again, they might get this again and that will result in a, a phobia around airplanes or you can attach that to anything else you want. So we do this as well with things like insomnia. So someone has a particularly tough day at work, they go to get into bed. Maybe they didn't do everything they needed to to gear themselves down. They're still feeling all that stress and anxiety. Maybe they crash into sleep because they're tired enough and then they wake up during the night and they go, oh my gosh, now I'm going to think about all these nasty things and, and they can't get back to sleep. Now they're back in this high beta state and it's a terrible night's sleep. 
The next night when they go to get into bed again, they're reminded because the bed now is associated with that feeling, that middle of the night feeling, the subconscious says, hey, remember the last time we were here? The predictive nature again, it's telling us that something bad could happen. It's our old caveman brain that's, that's trying to keep us safe. But what it ends up doing in our everyday world here is creating negative associations with things that don't necessarily need to exist. So what stimulus control does is it asks um, the, the patient to put off going to bed until they're tired and making sure that they've done everything they, they can do to prep themselves so that, you know, for the time that they want to go to bed, that they are, they will be ready for that but also waiting until they are tired and then going to bed. So now when they're tired enough and they've done everything they needed to to prep themselves, they're much more likely to have a better experience in bed. And now we start to reassociate the bed with a positive thing. So now we're creating a positive trigger. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, we do that in a repetitive way. We're using um, laws of repetition again, Laws of repetition is essential in hypnosis. So um, you'll often hear uh, me saying um, in hypnosis, when I, we, somebody wants to quit smoking or somebody wants to quit something, we will um, say, you know, each and every time you see a cigarette, you'll be reminded of something negative. We try and create a negative trigger to something that they don't want. And um, so then each and every time they see a cigarette after that, they'll be reminded of that. And we're using that law of repetition, that familiarity in a way that's constructive for that person. Relaxation, relaxation therapy. This one is also really big. We use this a lot in induction. So um, depending on the person, on their suggestibility. So someone's going to be either literal or they're going to be inferential with um, how they view the world. So if they're an inferential suggestibility, um, we, they will uh, read between the lines on pretty much everything that is said to them or that happens to them. So this happened to me because, um, whereas an, a literal person will say, well, this just happened to me just because it happened to me. There's nothing in between. There's no reading between the lines. It's just quite literal. And so when we look at doing an induction for someone, we will um, use either somatic tension reduction or we'll use cognitive arousal reduction concepts um, to, to help them gear down in the way that they relate to the world. So a literal person, a physical who relates to the world in such a literal way, we will use the somatic tension reduction in the form of abdominal breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, and autogenic training. Um, the cognitive arousal reduction, we typically use the guided imagery and meditation. We always use blends of these, but we will, um, for everybody, but we will um, put more emphasis on one over the other, depending on the suggestibility of that person. Uh, and it's interesting that they use this with the CBTI too, because um, it's, it's, it's just a common hypnosis thing. And it's really meant to help people shift that state of consciousness. People with um, hypervigilance like PTSD or attention deficit disorder are going to need the guidance in person or through a media to relax on their own. So media I'm talking about with apps and things like that. Autogenic training and hypnosis. So this is a really interesting one. This was developed by a psychologist in the 1920s. Um, and he did, he developed this technique because he saw the potential and the relaxing effects on the body during hypnosis. It is quite remarkable how relaxed the body can become during hypnosis. Um, it targets the physical expression of stress by using alpha and beta states of consciousness and direct suggestions of physical and mental calm. The way that it does this is, um, is quite unique. It, it is, again, it's, it's somewhat, um, we will use this similar techniques within hypnosis, actually, <laughs> actually it's hypnosis when you think about it, but it's just, um, it's just a, a different technique is people doing it from the conscious state, more like neuro-linguistic programming. Um, so they're working with their subconscious, but from more of a conscious state in uh, low beta. And uh, like I said, very effective induction technique <laughs> for physical suggestibles. So this is what it looks like. So basically you prep your space, get a comfortable um, 
and then you would focus on your breathing. So abdominal or slow and deep. And then as you're doing that, you're saying, I am completely calm. And when you feel you're completely calm, you can um, go back to focusing on now other areas of the body. So like an arm or a leg and say, oh, um, it understanding that it is uh, feeling that it is heavy or warm, whatever you want. And then when it's feeling very good, very heavy or very warm, you can say to yourself, I am completely calm. And you'll do this throughout your body until you come to your heart. Um, and then you would breathe deep saying my heart is calm and regular. And then you would end with, I am completely calm. So this is um, affirmations. So it's basically um, suggestions. Affirmations are simply suggestions taken in the conscious state or something that you want. So what is hypnotherapy? So it's the use of hypnosis for treatment of a medical or psychological disorder or concern. So um, we use it basically to help people shift their, their perception. And this is only because their existing perception is causing them limitations in their life. So we all have different perceptions from each other. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It's what makes us individuals actually. But where it starts to become a problem is where it starts limiting us and causing us to become um, dependent or dysfunctional in our lives. So um, what we do with the hypnotherapy is, is we're shifting that consciousness, just like we did with sleep, just like you do with meditation, but we're shifting it consciously um, and helping that person in a guided sort of way to reframe that perception towards that which benefits an outcome instead of something that's limiting them. Um, unfortunately, uh, hypnotherapy in North America is the last line of therapy. And it's because of its lack of regulation and acceptance and availability in other areas of the world, such as the UK, it's quite predominant and regulated. So what does a session look like? Session is very cool. You know already a lot of what a hypnotherapy session looks like just from describing some of these other things. But basically, again, we set up a rapport. So when people come into my office, um, we sit down, we have a nice little discussion about what they want. So my big question is, what do you want? People are very good about knowing what they don't want. I don't want to smoke anymore. I don't want to uh, eat too much anymore. I don't want... Um, to feel this anxiety anymore. However, they don't know what they do want. And so this is something that we, I'll help them sort of dig a little bit and then we'll find what that is. And then we start into the session. So I get them to close their eyes, they center themselves, they refocus inward because most of our focus is outward when we're not um, aware of who we are inside. And so we get them refocusing inward, um, getting that mind body sort of perception going again and integration. And then we do an induction um, and th that basically shifts them away from their body awareness and more towards uh, the subconscious mind. I do a deepener, which um, is usually the, the difference between what we would call meditation and hypnosis. The deepener is what people will say is uh, that counting down. So counting backwards from 10 down to one or, or something else, depending on the person. We'll use often somatic or the visualization techniques to achieve that. Um, so a set of stairs, walking on a beach, uh, whatever uh, seems to be most relatable for that particular client. And then we reframe. We reframe basically that subconscious program that was created when they were five years old and is now wreaking havoc with their life and we uh, reframe it into something that is useful for them now um, and then we'll use different techniques like I was mentioning earlier that timeline or um, imprinting uh, and then at the end once people come back up we count them back out again um, we have a, a quiet discussion they tell me what stands out to them and we bring more of what they've learned all of that wisdom back into that conscious state and we anchor it in with post-hypnotic suggestions using laws of repetition so each and every time they see this now they can think of the thing that they just learned okay menopause this is really um important in terms of talking about um the effects of insomnia on people Insomnia is so prevalent in menopause, 28 to 
of women in menopause report sleep problems, either during it or post. Most of it's related to hot flashes. And we also see all stages of sleep are affected. So it's affecting the person as a whole. And this is something that's happening outside of sleep. It's affecting the whole of sleep in general. And then of course, you know, women, we're, we're very resilient creatures. We uh, will just kind of soldier on and we'll use, um, you know, prescriptions. Uh, you'll get a prescription from your doctor. Oh, it's hot flashes. Okay. So we're using this or that, and there's not anything that's really effective um, for uh, the insomnia piece. We'll get some medications, uh, maybe hormone replacement therapy or other uh, medications that can uh, work with the mood swings or, or whatever, but there's nothing that um, uh, addresses the insomnia piece directly in the hot flashes. So this was a really, really interesting study. Um, and this is what triggered me to um, put um, menopause in general as a highlight in this presentation. Uh, what they, this, this study did is it, it used self-hypnosis um, for women in menopause and specifically women that were having difficulties with these hot flashes. What they found was a significant reduction of poor sleep quality in all groups with a significant increase in minutes slept. So basically what they're seeing there is when you increase sleep quality, you're gonna decrease the number of awakenings or arousals, EEG arousals throughout the night. And what that's gonna do is increase your sleep efficiency. And when you increase them in sleep efficiency, the um, sleep quality just uh, is, is huge. So you're able to cycle through those sleep stages in the appropriate amounts and, um, and movements exactly how it's supposed to go. Um, <laughs> clinically meaningful improvements um, in reducing the perception of poor sleep quality in 50 to 77% of women across time. So basically what this is saying is that over time post-study, 50 to 77% percent had clinically meaningful improvements continuing on post study. I mean, that's incredible. The, the, the most interesting piece about this in the end too was the delivery system. So they had different ways that people could do the hypnosis sessions, the phone delivery one, where they did the, the um, hypnosis um, for these women, it was just effective as doing in person um, sessions. And so this lends, um, you know, such availability to people who may not be able to, to get in or um, may not have access in their area. And if we can have this, you know, this significantly, um, significantly uh, improved quality of sleep and life in general, and do this long term. From the phone, oh my goodness, it's, this, this uh, study was just um, incredible for me. I think um, we'll probably be seeing more of this coming out. The study's only two years old and there's going to be a lot more of this, uh, this research, I believe. The other one uh, that really um, uh, got my attention was uh, the use of hypnosis and slow wave sleep. So this is a really, interesting um, a study that was done by Besadovsky and uh, company. And they um, basically, they took uh, they had two um, groups of people and um, one group just listened to, you know, plain hypnotic suggestions that were just general hypnotic suggestions. The other ones listened to hypnotic suggestions um, that suggested that they would increase the time spent uh, in slow wave sleep. And um, <laughs> what they found was they actually did that. So uh, the, the hypnotic suggestions increased, um, had a fourfold increase in growth hormone levels and a distinct shift in the sympathovagal balance towards reduced sympathetic predominance. So spending more time with that delta wave activity happening. And when you have this higher... Um, growth hormone levels circulating throughout the body. When you think about the impact that that can have on all the physiological functions, such as growth, regulation of growth, uh, metabolism, immunity, tissue repair, cardiovascular, this is 
a whole potential range of applications that can be opened up just simply with hypnotic suggestions. This is uh, was an incredible, incredible study. Um, and finally, this was a commentary um, done on uh, Scott and company, basically for um, you know how effective is CBTI and is it is it effective um, long term? So they looked uh, further down the road, just as we looked at the uh, hypnosis effects on women with insomnia long term. We we're looking at CBTI as well, because in CBTI, what happens is is you know people often come in and say, "I'd love to sleep." the seven to eight hours. And throughout that time period of the eight, 10 weeks, whatever that they're doing the CBTI, they don't typically see a significant increase in time slept. However, up to 24 months later, um, the total sleep time gains were impressive. So um, it, you know, we didn't see this happening at the beginning, but that if we had a little bit of patience um, that uh, CBTI, uh, you know, could be quite helpful in the long run as well. The difficulty is convincing the patient to stick with it. So this is where the pharmacotherapy has come in. Um, but if we could um, inject some other cognitive behavioral ideas with uh, hypnosis, we're already using so many components of what we do with hypnosis. Why not give people the intention? there to make it a true self-hypnosis session and then see what they can do like we did with the, the slow wave sleep here. So in summary, many basic components of hypnosis and hypnotherapy are already utilized and aspects routinely accepted and in insomnia treatments already, such as CBTI and BTI. Uh, hypnotherapy also just familiarizes the client with this alpha state and allows them to understand that they can um, facilitate this transition into deeper levels of consciousness, including sleep, not just hypnosis, not just meditation, but also sleep. And it just comes down to what intention are you going in with? Uh, the hypnotherapy just has so many parallels in terms of levels of consciousness and benefits to overall health. And there's all these promising studies with the slow wave sleep and menopause um, that, you know, can really, um, in fact, it, illustrate the significant potential that, that we could have with hypnosis in within these uh, treatment modalities uh, for people long term. And hypnotherapy is becoming more widely accepted because um, because it, it doesn't really have risk factors. And, uh, you know, there's so many um, positive uh, outcomes that we could have with sleep disorder, especially from these few studies that we can see, um, as well as, you know, cognitive and, and physical diseases. So these are my references. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you have any questions or you would like to contact me, please feel free. It's uh, Sherry, S-H-E-R-R-I at breathehypnotherapy.ca. Well, thank you so much for your time.